أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تبارك الذي جعل في السماء بروجا وجعل فيها سراجا وقمرا منيرا وهو الذي جعل الليل والنهار خلفة لمن أراد أن يذكر أو أراد شكورا وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هونا وإذا خاطبهم الجاهلون قالوا سلاما والذين يبيتون لربهم سجدا وقياما والذين يقولون ربنا اصرف عنا عذاب جهنم إن عذابها كان غراما إنها ساء مستقرا ومقاما والذين إذا أنفقوا لم يسرفوا ولم يقتروا لم يسرفوا ولم يقتروا وكان بين ذلك قواما والذين لا يدعون مع الله إلها آخر ولا يقتلون النفس التي حرم الله إلا بالحق ولا يزنون ومن يفعل ذلك يلقى أثاما يضاعف له العذاب يوم القيامة ويخلد فيه مهانا إلا من تاب وآمن وعمل عملا صالحا فأولئك فأولئك يبدل الله سيئاتهم حسنات وكان الله غفورا رحيما ومن تاب وعمل صالحا فإنه يتوب إلى الله متابا والذين لا يشهدون الزور وإذا مروا باللغو مروا كراما والذين إذا ذكروا بآيات ربهم لم يخروا عليها صما وعميانا والذين يقولون ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا, وجعلنا للمتقين إماما أولئك يجزون الغرفة بما صبروا ويلقوا قون فيها تحية وسلاما خالدين فيها حسنت مستقرا ومقاما قل ما يعبأ بكم ربي لولا دعاءكم فقد كذبتم فقد كذبتم فسوف يكون لزاما صدق الله العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة وبركاته طيب إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونصلي ونسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا 
وزيدنا علما إنك أنت السميع القريب المجيب. First of all, I just want to say Jazakallah khairan to the Warul Taqi program, you know, for um, inviting me here. I'm, well, I'm very honored and I feel very blessed to be have this opportunity to talk about this really, this subject that is such an honor to speak about, subhanAllah. You know, the topic of the Quran and the topic of, you know, how the companions live with the Quran. I was actually very keen to do this topic, subhanAllah, not only for everybody listening, but even for my own self just to have take that moment to you know reflect about how the companions used to live with the quran subhanallah and you know what kind of effect the quran had on their hearts how they acted upon the quran you know how they turned to the quran as their number one source in all of their affairs because sisters and brothers as we know allah ta'ala sent down the quran as a complete guide and framework for us to follow in all of our lives. You know, Allah Ta'ala sent the Quran to show us what is halal and what is haram. You know, to know our rights. You know, what are our rights? What are our limits? And he sent the Quran as a reminder to us and also as a warning. And he sent it as a means for us to turn to in our times of, you know, hardships and trials and in order to, you know, seek comfort from it, inshallah. But sadly, when we look at the state of the Ummah today, you find that, you know, for, for many people, unfortunately, you find they would rather listen to music than, for example, to recite or listen to Quran. And then you have others who, you know, for them, listening to the Quran has become more like, you know, listening to a song where they get far more carried away, you know, from the voice of the Qari, for example, than, than their hearts actually get affected from what Allah Ta'ala is commanding or warning about in those verses that they're listening to. And subhanAllah, this is a state, in fact, that Allah Ta'ala has, you know, warned us from falling into this. Um, Allah Ta'ala says, you know, وَقَالَ رَسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا That, you know, the messenger has said, Oh my Lord, Verily, inna qawmi taqwadu had al Qur'an mahjura. Verily, my people have you know turned away and you know taken this Quran as something to abandon. So that's why, my dear sisters and brothers, what we need to focus, you know, what we want to focus on today, inshallah, is first of all how the companions were with the Quran, and then secondly, what we need to do in order to benefit from the Quran in order to try to benefit from the Qur'an in the same way that they used to, inshallah, bi'ithnillah. Because sisters and brothers, when we read the stories of the Sahaba and we read about, you know, what they achieved in their lives, you know, their levels of ibadah that they reached, their closeness and absolute love and, and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to realize that, you know, there's a reason behind why they were able to attain all of these virtues after the help of Allah. And from the primary reasons for that was their dedication, their sincere dedication to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, along with, of course, the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because if you compare, for example, how much they used to recite the Quran, you know, from their habit, from their normal habit, was they used to divide the Quran into seven parts. So what they would do is they would basically, you know, recite the Quran day and night, until they would complete the whole Quran within seven days. So you can see how their life was, you know, every week, they're basically com completing the Quran, the whole Quran in one week. And we see how when Abdullah ibn Amr was asked, you know, he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about how much Quran he should recite. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam initially told him, you know, just recite it, recite it once a month. But then when Abdullah ibn Amr told him that he can do it more than that, the Prophet وسلم, told him, read it once every seven days and, and don't do more than that. But what we can see from these, you know, these different narrations is that, you know, for the Sahaba, the Quran wasn't something that they only opened and read once a year in Ramadan. All right. And then the rest of the year, they, it just sat on their shelves. Rather, we see that, you know, their lives were literally, you know, revolving around the recitation of the Quran and you know they were, they were they were reciting it day and night subhanallah also if you compare to the way in which they used to recite the Quran 
because you know when the companions would recite the quran they didn't do that out of seeking the reward for reciting it only it wasn't only you know just to get the reward from the recitation but rather when they would recite it they would recite it as if allah was speaking to them personally you know in every ayah they came to they would internalize the meanings of the quran and this is why we see you know the, the pr profound impact that the Quran actually had on their hearts because of how much, like I said, they would, you know, internalize the meanings of the ayat when they would recite them. And, you know, Allah Ta'ala even describes this relationship that the companions had with the Quran. You know, if you look at the beginning of Surah Al-Anfal, Allah Ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ that verily those believers are the ones who when Allah Ta'ala is mentioned to them, their hearts, you know, shake with, with reverence of Allah Ta'ala. And when the ayat of Allah Ta'ala are recited to them, they feel that their iman is strengthened. And they they put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah ta'ala tells us how, you know, whenever the companions would hear the verses of the Quran, their hearts would become filled with khushur. You know, and they'd feel their iman has become increased due to the power of those words that we're reciting. And subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, this is also why, you know, you find that the quality of their salah was worlds apart from the quality of our salah. And similarly, we can say that, you know, the effect of their salah, you know, the effect that their salah had on their lives was also worlds apart from the extent to which our salah has an effect on our lives. Because, you know, when one of them would stand to pray, they used to recite the ayat with, you know, complete tadabbur, you know, complete pondering of those verses. And so they would become so affected by their recitation that many times they wouldn't even be able to continue reciting due to how much they would begin to cry and weep in their prayers, subhanAllah. And that's why, you know, once when the Prophet وسلم, became so ill, he wasn't able to lead, you know, the prayers and he asked for Abu Bakr to take his place. We see Aisha, what does she say? She said, Inna Abu Bakr, verily Abu Bakr, you know, he's a man who has a very soft heart. That you know, he becomes over when he recites in the in the prayer, he becomes overwhelmed with you know with crying and tears, subhanAllah. Because very often the moment that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu would stand before Allah Ta'ala in salah and begin to recite, for example, Surah Fatiha, he would become overcome with, with tears, subhanAllah, due to the softness of his heart. And, you know, Abdullah ibn Shiddad, he tells us about how he used to hear, you know, he would be standing in the back rows of the Salah and he would hear the weeping of Omar ibn Khattab as he was leading the prayer. And, you know, he'd hear Omar reciting, for example, Innama ashku bathi wa huzni in Allah. Verily, I complain of my burdens and my sadness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, also we, we see when um, Abdullah, ibn, um, Abdullah ibn Urwa, he asked his grandmother, Asmat bint Abi Bakr, radiallahu anhuma, about how the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to recite the Quran. You know, she describes it. She saw them, subhanAllah, and she, was, she told him that when they would recite the Quran, their eyes would get tears. You know, their skins would tremble exactly as Allah ta'ala described them in the Quran. SubhanAllah, this is the difference between the way they used to recite the Quran and the way that may Allah subhanahu wa soften our hearts. This is, yani, this is how they used to recite in comparison to the way we recite. Also, if you compare how determined the companions used to be in doing whatever was in their ability to seek out the deeper meanings behind whatever ayat they were reciting, right? They, they you know, in order for them to attain the true benefits from whatever they were reciting, they would, you know, do whatever was in their ability to, to seek out the deeper meanings. And, and, and many of you probably have heard this before, but, you know, whenever the companions would learn, for example, 10 ayats of the Quran, they wouldn't go on to learn another 10 verses 
until they had properly understood, you know, the ilm or the knowledge that they needed to gain from those ayats and what they needed to do in order to act upon those verses. And the other thing you see is how many times they would stand in their prayers and they would recite the same ayah over and over again, you know, pondering that ayah. Why? You know, in order to reflect upon the deep and powerful lessons and meanings that is contained within that ayah. Because their primary goal of reciting the Quran was to try to extract, you know, the maximum benefit possible from every ayah that they would come to. And, you know, there was a time, there was one time when, for example, one of the nephews of Aisha, radiallahu anha, came to, you know, visit her in the morning. She was praying the duha prayer. And, you know, he found her reciting uh, one of the verses from Surah At-Tur. And, you know, she's reciting it over and over again in her prayer. And the ayah is, فَمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْنَا وَوَقَانَ عَذَابَ السَّمُومِ That in this ayah, you know, Allah Ta'ala is saying, you know, he's talking about the mu'minin when they enter Jannah and they're feeling so relieved, having reached, finally reached Jannah all, after all those hardships and all that hard life. And they reach Jannah. And Allah has saved them. You know, imagine the ecstasy and the happiness of knowing that you've been saved from the fire. Surely Allah has, we are truly blessed that Allah, you know, has, you know, this is truly a blessing upon us um, that we have, you know, reached Jannah safely and that Allah has saved us from the fire. So, you know, imagine Aisha radiallahu anha, you know, she's reflecting on this ayah and, you know, so her nephew says that, you know, she was reciting this ayah over and over again, you know, and she was crying and making dua for so long that he said, my legs got tired waiting for her to finish her prayer. And so what did he do? He went to the market. He went, he thought, I'll go to the market. I'll, I'll buy what I need. And he came back sometime later. But even after all that time he was away, he found when he came back that she was still standing there in her prayers crying and repeating that ayah over and over again, subhanAllah. So what this shows you is how much the Sahaba, they used to really take that time, you know, to ponder over the ayat of the Quran and to really, you know, think deeply about, you know, all the hidden meanings and lessons that we need to take from its verses. But brothers and sisters, you know, one important point that I do want to uh, mention here as well is we shouldn't think that the effect that the Quran had upon the Sahaba was only limited to them, you know, crying and, you know, feeling khushur in their hearts. Because one of the major differences between how they used to recite the Quran and, and how, unfortunately, we tend to recite the Quran is that, you know, like I said before, whenever they would recite, they would feel as if Allah Ta'ala was speaking to them personally. And that's why whenever Allah Ta'ala would, you know, send down an ayah, the first person they would think about that Allah was referring to in that ayah was themselves. You know, what do we tend to do? We tend to think it's everybody else except ourselves. May Allah forgive us. But that's why you see when, you know, Allah Ta'ala sent down the ayah in Surah Hujurat, uh, where he says, Yeah, ya amanu, la aswatakum Oh, you who believe, do not raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nor speak to him in a loud way like you would speak to each other in case your deeds become wiped out and you don't realize. All right, so when this ayah came down, Thabit bin Qais, you know, heard heard about this ayah and subhanallah he became so worried that this ayah was speaking about him personally so what did he do he went and he hid himself away from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he felt so shy and embarrassed from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he kept on saying ana min ahlin nar you know that i am Allah protect us he said i am from the people of the fire you know verily i must be from the people of the fire because allah's revealed ayat you know about me because he knew that he was from those who used to have the bad habit of, you know, raising his voice too loudly in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And SubhanAllah, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, was, was told about that, in fact, what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he said, Bal huwa min ahli jannah. SubhanAllah, rather he is from ahli jannah. So imagine, this is how Thabit bin Qais, 
became from the very few people who were guaranteed, guaranteed Jannah while they were still in this dunya, subhanAllah. But what we learn from this incident is the extent to which the companions used to feel the ayat, you know, were directed at them personally. And, you know, this is why you see the huge effect that the Quran used to have upon their behavior and character and all of their outward actions. And this is also why, you know, you see, you know, for example, when the ayat of hijab were revealed, as soon as the female companions heard those ayat, we see how, what did they do? They went and they rushed to their homes, you know, tore up their aprons and covered themselves completely, subhanAllah. You know, Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, you know, Ya rahamullahu nisa al-muhajirat. May Allah be merciful to the women of Al-Muhajirat. Because as soon as these the verses came down, which Allah says, well, you know, to, to, to draw your, hum, your, your khimar over, you know, around over yourselves and cover, you know, yourselves with your khimar. What did the Sahabiyat do? She said they, they rushed and they tore up their aprons. And she, she, explicitly mentions what they did with those aprons she said that they wore it like a khimar they, they put it around and they, they wore it like a khimar over themselves covering themselves with it completely subhanallah what was the reason for the reaction because you know as soon as they heard those verses they took it they took it to mean that allah ta'ala was commanding them personally to do that all right so this is the difference in the way that they used to um recite the Quran when you know they were always thinking about what Allah's trying to tell them through the you know what's he commanding me through these verses and this is this is how you know this is how much the Quran you know used to affect them not only inwardly but also in all of their outward actions and this is why we see how you know it, would, would, it actually would cause them to reform themselves that's what we should be seeing. You know, when we're reciting the Quran, when we're listening to the Quran and revising and, and memorizing the Quran, it should actually cause us to reform ourselves, you know. But this was the effect it was having on the Sahaba, that they were, you know, the, the, the Quran itself was, you know, subhanAllah, the words of Allah Ta'ala was, was causing them to reform themselves and, you know, to stay away from the haram and, you know, to implement whatever Allah has ordered for us to do as believers. Um, you know, also from the effects that the Quran used to have upon the Sahaba that I wanted to mention as well here is that, you know, it would, it would cause them to realize the triviality of this dunya, you know, and to strive whatever they had in order to gain the, the you know, the, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Jannah in the next life. And that's why you see how when um, Abu Talha, when he heard the verses where Allah Ta'ala says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ Right? When these verses came down, in which Allah Ta'ala says that you will not attain al-bir, you will not attain, you know, righteousness and taqwa with Allah unless you spend what you love. We see how Thabit, uh, Abu Talha, sorry, we see how Abu Talha, he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, verily, the most beloved wealth that I own is my date palm garden, Bayruha. You know, his date palm garden called Bayruha. And so he said, and so I wish to give it in sadaqah for the sake of Allah, that I may attain al-bir, that I may attain the high levels of bir and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by that. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, ذَلِكَ مَالٌ رَابِحِ That subhanAllah, that is a most profitable wealth. Another example of the way in which the companions used to live with the Quran is they would take the Quran as their primary, you know, their first primary source in all of their affairs. And that's why if, you know, if one of them, for example, held a certain opinion about something in the deen, and then later on, you know, they found out that the, the, the Quran has said something different, you'll see how they would instantly change their opinion, even if it meant they had to go and do that in front of all of the people. You know, one good example of that is when one time Omar radiallahu anhu, you know, he stood on the minbar in the masjid, you know, telling the Muslims that he wanted to restrict the amount of mahr that can be given to a woman in marriage. And of course, it's understandable when people go to extremes in, you know, in, in, uh, in how much mahr they demand. 
So that's why, you know, Omar wanted to restrict this because he could see it was becoming something harmful. But then after he, you know, had mentioned this in, in the masjid, one of the ladies came up to him and said to him, you know, yeah, yeah, Amir al-Mu'mineen, you know, are you prohibiting people from giving women more than 400 dirhams, you know, for their dowry? When Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, that you have given one of them the amount of a qintar as a mahr. And she said, and a qintar is a very large amount of money. So Allah didn't restrict it. So why should we restrict it? She was saying. And subhanAllah, we see how as soon as Umar radiallahu anhu heard that ayah, you know, instantly, you know, he, he basically reacted by first, you know, he went and, you know, corrected that statement and he said, may Allah forgive Umar, right? So brothers and sisters, you know, we need to realize that one of the main reasons why there's such a huge difference between the way the Sahaba were and how we are at this time is because they used to recite the Quran, you know, not only with their tongues, but also by reflecting upon the ayat with their hearts. And then they would follow that up by, you know, acting upon whatever Allah Ta'ala, you know, commanded or forbade, uh, forbade them to, you know, forbade us to do in those ayat. And that's why we see how Allah Ta'ala gave them izzah. You know, he gave them tawfiq, he gave them honor, he gave them greatness, he gave them success in both this life and the next. And that's why, you know, we find ourselves, you know, subhanAllah, in the state that we find ourselves in today, whether as individuals or even, you know, on the scale of the ummah, may Allah subhanahu ta'ala, you know, give us the ability to, you know, rectify our condition and, and help us all to make the Quran a living reality in our lives, because this is really something missing in the majority of our lives. May Allah subhanahu ta'ala help us to, you know, increase this, inshallah. So sisters and brothers, uh, before we finish today, I wanted to quickly speak about you know, some of the things that we can do to try to, you know, improve our relationship with the Quran, inshallah. And, you know, to be honest, this needs a whole lecture of its own. So I'm just going to highlight, you know, like about three areas that we, we can focus on. They're very important. They're probably from the main, most important things we need to focus on if we want to improve our relationship with the Quran, inshallah. So the first thing is that we need to be prepared to do what it takes to improve our recitate, you know, to improve our understanding of the Quran, right? We need to be able to, we need to be ready to put in the, the time and the effort in order to improve our understanding of the Quran. And that includes learning how to recite the Quran correctly. You know, it also includes, you know, you know, doing your best to study the tafsir of the Quran as much as you can. And also it includes learning the Arabic language as much as you're able. Because, you know, as someone who's personally gone through this journey of, you know, and starting out from not even understanding, you know, one word of Arabic in the beginning when I first reverted, you know, alhamdulillah, like, I can definitely say that there's a huge difference in how, you know, the Quran impacts your heart when you understand Arabic, you know, compared to if you only, you know, read the English translation. And, you know, I would say that, you know, one of the main reasons why so many, so many people uh, feel there's such a big, big disconnect between, you know, themselves and, you know, for example, loving the Quran is, you know, it's primarily due to them missing this important link to the Quran, right? Um, so I understand that, you know, yes, you know, it can take quite a bit of effort and years to get past this level in your understanding. But, you know, when you do it, it will be totally worth it. Bi'idnillahi ta'ala. And you remember the words of Allah when he says, subuluna, that those who strive, um, you know, those who those who strive for our sake, then Allah guides, He will guide them to His paths and He'll open up ta'ala the paths to you know understanding and deepening your love and you know deepening your connection with the Quran, inshallah. All right, the second thing uh, that we really need to focus on is we need to realize that. Uh, sins and diseases of the heart are what can prevent your heart from being affected by the Quran. Because, you know, whether it's certain sins that you're, you're doing, you know, maybe in your private life or even your public life, or, you know, you have 
certain diseases of diseases of the heart, like it could be hasad, you know, jealousy. It could be having bad feelings, holding grudges against people, or you know, uh, riya, male protect us, you know, showing off, or you know, having too much love for dunya. They're all different types of diseases of the heart, right? But we have to realize that from the causes for the heart to become hard, um, you know, are uh, if we are engaging in certain sins and we're allowing these diseases to basically fester in our hearts right and then what happens is that when the heart becomes hard from that then it no longer benefits you know it, it no longer benefits from from the quran and, and it you know you can you can actually lose your love for the quran may Allah protect us and this is exactly why osman ibn affan you know he said that, you know, if our hearts were truly pure or truly purified, we would never, ever get tired or sick of, you know, subhanAllah, we would never, you know, get tired or bored, you know, from, from the words of our Lord. So it, it shows you that, you know, we need to realize that basically, you know, if you find that you, you do, you know, quickly get tired from like listening or you get bored, you know, from listening or reciting the Quran, you need to look at, you need to sometimes look at what you're exposing yourself to. I mean, our environment all has an impact on us, you know. Um, so what you look, you know, what you're exposing to yourself, like what kind of sins maybe you're, you're engaging in that could actually be coming, you know, causing that, that could be a cause that's, you know, coming in between you and and having that strong connection with with, with, with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, also, another thing to recommend here is, you know, Try making al istighfar, you know, before, especially before reciting the Quran. If you have this problem, try making al istighfar, you know, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, before reciting the Quran and, you know, asking Allah Ta'ala to, you know, purify your heart from any of these diseases that could be causing it to be hardened. I mean, even ask Allah to, even ask Allah Ta'ala to, um, you know, if, ask Allah Ta'ala um to you know to take this hardness out of your heart you know ask Allah Ta'ala to take this hardness out of your heart because even hardness of the heart is a type of disease right and you know subhanallah the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he used to actually seek refuge with Allah Ta'ala from the hardness of the heart and, and this, this is the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so so what about us you know he has that dua which we can learn to say inshallah allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa you know, oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from, you know, the knowledge that does not benefit and, you know, the heart that does not fear you and doesn't have reverence and, and you know, doesn't have softness. And, you know, from a, a nafs, you know, from, you know, a self that, that doesn't get, um, doesn't get satisfied and from, from a dua that doesn't get answered all right so it's important that we we seek the help of the help with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we seek help from Allah in you know softening our hearts because if the heart is not soft we cannot receive this message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then lastly the last thing we need to focus on the, the, th the third main uh, point I wanted to mention is we need to focus on rectifying our approach and mindset when it comes to reciting the Quran. And, you know, from the advices of Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimallah, he says that, you know, in order to truly benefit from the Quran, you first need to empty your heart from everything in this dunya. So just say you're about to recite the Quran, you open up the Quran or you want to revise some Quran, you need to basically start out, start out by firstly emptying your heart from everything in this dunya, you know, whether it's problems or worries or whatever you're thinking about, right? And then the next step is to focus your full attention and heart on the words you're reciting. And then while you're reciting, you remind yourself that this is Allah speaking to you through these words. And that, you know, in every ayah you're reciting, there's so many benefits and lessons that you need to learn from and, and take the benefits and, and deeper meanings from these ayat. So that's why you need to, you know, keep on asking yourself as you're reciting, you know, what is Allah Ta'ala want to tell me by this ayah what, what's the message behind this ayah you know how can I implement this ayah in my life how can I act upon it 
you know, even what you can do is, you, you know, make dua and ask Allah Ta'ala to show you, you know, ya Allah, ya Allah, show me, teach me what I need to learn from this ayah that I'm reciting. So you need to realize that, you know, in order for the Quran, you know, to truly benefit and affect you, you, you need to make yourself receptive to it to, to begin with. And then finally, uh, you know, dear sisters and brothers, you know, just realize that it's through reciting the Quran, you know, with proper tadabbur, proper pondering over the verses that Allah Ta'ala plants into your heart all of the seeds that actually nourish your iman. You know, seeds like tawakkul in Allah, you know, depending on Allah and, you know, having fear from Allah and having hope in Allah and love for Allah and being grateful to Allah and, you know, being patient for the sake of Allah. All of those seeds are planted into your heart as you recite the Quran, subhanAllah. And at the same time, Allah Ta'ala purifies your heart from all of the diseases and vices that, you know, corrupt your heart, subhanAllah. So we ask Allah Ta'ala, you know, Nas'adullah, Nas'adullah Ta'ala, and yaj'al al-Qur'an al-Azim, rabi'a qulubina. وَنُورَ صُدُورِنَا وَجَلَاءَ أَحْزَنِنَا وَذَهَابَ هُمُمِنَا وَغُمُمِنَا We ask Allah Ta'ala to make the Qur'an, you know, the delight of our hearts and the light of our chests and the remover of our sadness and, you know, the pacifier of all of our worries and concerns. وَأَنْ يَرُزُقُنَا تِلَوَتَهُ إِنْ أَنَاءِ اللَّيْلِ وَأَطْرَافِ النَّهَارِ And that he blesses us he gives us the blessing of being able to recite it day and night, Ya Rabbil Alameen. وَأَنْ يَجْعَلَهُ حُجَّةً لَنَا وَلَا عَلَيْنَا I ask Allah, we ask Allah that He makes the Qur'an a proof for us on Yom Qiyamah, not a proof against us. That's, that's, that's the, you know, it's part of the, the thing we have to avoid at all costs. We don't want to be reciting the Qur'an and then those words we recite become a witness for against us on Yom Qiyamah. We want those words to be a witness for us, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. So I ask Allah ta'ala, you know, to revive our love for the Qur'an in our hearts. I ask Allah ta'ala to fill our hearts with the love for the Qur'an and to fill our children's hearts with the love for the Qur'an and to, you know, light up our, our households, light up, you know, light up our lives, inshallah, with the light of the Qur'an. Ya Rabbil Alameen. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وسبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ولا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك.